Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the BKB National Wool Market Report with Jock Talliard and myself. Welcome Jock. Good evening Leon. We had an interview with Eamon Timms, the National Wool Brokerage Manager of Fox & Lily in Australia to find out what their thoughts are on sustainability and where they see the market in the medium term. But before we get to that, let's have a look what happened in our own market this week. Our early market indicators show a discount in price mainly due to the RAND strengthening against all the major currencies. The RAND is trading stronger against the US dollar by 2.5% compared to the last auction we had on the 24th of March. We had a much larger offering compared to the previous auction and the total amount of bales on offer were 12,300 bales. Today's auction continued to attract a solid support for the finer microns with the 18.5 micron and finer wools ending the day dearer across all types and descriptions. The broader microns continue to track downward ending the day, the day cheaper when compared to the previous auction. Certified sustainable wool at great competition and the premium eased a little bit compared to, to previous auctions but still yeah. I think it, 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 it sold well and, and kept it ground. Leon, yeah, I think uh, that slightly eased off uh, is 100% on currency. We know currency plays a big role in our market. It always will. Uh, but with the 18 and a half, there was some very nice clips on. Absolutely. And uh, I can I can vow for eight, seven, eight percent of some of my clients that I've been seeing that been selling dearer yeah. than the previous sales and. Uh, it's RWS and it's the package. That's what I like about uh, a 12,000 bale catalog, a big catalog. It's the package that's available for the buyer and uh, you can ship it off on Monday, full containers yeah. and the next auction it'll be a totally new contract for him. Yeah. I, I think despite the, 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 the RAND strengthening by 2.5, we were, uh, our early market indicators show that we discounted by about let's say about 3% that we discounted, but I don't think uh, we, we didn't saw that on the fine side, the fine side uh, sold, sold, uh, for, sold dearer, so, yes, so, yeah. so they sold about uh, uh, dearer by 3%, but, mm. but not only on the fine side, the, your, your solid types, um, wool without fall, uh, wool that measured well, um, they, they also um, didn't, didn't experience the same discount. Than, than, than some of the other wools. Yeah. So, so, so it were, were, were a, a different type of auction that, that we used to. Yeah. Yeah. We, had to we had to work for the, for the prices today. Yeah. It wasn't a walkover. Uh, yes, your, your higher yield, the high NKT lots, got their premiums. Yeah. Definitely. Even, even on the medium sides, yeah. they, they stole their premium. And uh, at the end of the day, it, it's all what's been offered, like I said, it's the package. I'd, I'd like to, to, to just concentrate on that uh, with the market. This, the lambs, we've seen them under pressure today. Well, they follow the market and I think that is 100% uh, yeah. currency related. Yeah. Uh, the deals, the shorts, they, they were expensive. They were very expensive. I would say the short deals, ELs, uh, locks that sold yesterday, they were dearer. They definitely were dearer, and it, it, it's a different market. You, you can't compare that yeah. with the average market that that you. So uh, the SA Martin Marinos, unfortunately, they were under pressure again. Uh, so we don't see much movement there, and I would say the coarser that gets, then the, the more pressure there is. No, absolutely. Um, I think we had. A I think we had a, we had a good sale despite the the, the, the two and a half half percent that the rand strengthened, and uh, and we had our, our buyers who came through for the day: Standard Wool, Moriano, and and Lampier, who were our top three buyers for the day. And they and they the, between the three of them, they're keeping the the, the, the top three um, for the for the past few auctions now. So so we would like to thank them, but not on, only the three the three. The top three buyers, all of the buyers who participate in the auction and uh, and and make the, make make an auction possible. So thanks a lot to our buyers. Yeah, yeah. But well, you're looking at between those three buyers, they were buying two and a half, three thousand bale each. So that is a big that's a big cut that they that they yeah. take up. 
and, and, and it's good that, that they that they actually kept it right to the end. Uh, we were still auctioning right till four o'clock this afternoon. Yeah. So it was a tough day. Yeah. It uh, was a tough day. Yeah. And but then of course it's not 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 only the buyers. We have uh, producers there as well, and we would like to congratulate uh, Mr. Freddy Duplessis, Rabocco Boerderij from Tarkastad, who sold three. B double F bales of uh, 15.8 micron for 204 and 90 cents uh, with standard wool the buyer there. So well done, Mr. Freddy. Uh, on a ESS, on a every sheet tested lot. Uh, well done, beautiful lot. That paid off. That that extra yeah. effort that he puts in, it, it paid off definitely today in this market. Yeah, yeah. Second place as well with his one bale of B Hoggett. Yeah. And then on third place, Janni Geilem from. Uh, Wackerström, well done. He's two bales of beer hoggets with a 16.2 micron, 195 rand 70. Uh, excellent prices. Uh, we see God bought that lot here. Yeah. Jock, thanks a lot. That's that from the from, from, from the market reporting side. Um, let's have a look at the pre-recorded chat we had with Eamon Timms from Fox and Lily. Ladies and gentlemen, and as promised, we have an interview with uh, Eamon Timms, the National Wool Broker Manager from Fox & Lily. Eamon, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Leon. Good to have a talk to you guys. Eamon, maybe for a start, give us a, give us a little bit of a uh, background about yourself and, uh, and Fox and & Lily as well. Uh, so Fox and Lily to start with um, it was a company kicked off in 1948 um, as a wool buying company in Australia, and so and it's still owned by the same family that started the business, so the Lily family. Um, so the Fox part of the partnership was there at the start, but then after 20 years um, he retired, and the Lilies have kept running the business ever since. So from a, purely from a wool buying, wool export business in 1948, um, over the years transformed into having two divisions. And so nowadays we have Fox and Lily Rural, who deals with the wool growers and act as an agent for the wool growers for handling and testing their wool and selling to the wool trade and collecting the, the, the monies and passing on to the growers. And then the other side of the business is the original side of the business, Fox and Lily Australia, who are a major buyer and exporter of wool out of Australia. So the background of Fox and Lily was very much in the, the cardings side of business, all the short wools, um, but over the over the years that's changed a lot. So now they deal in all types and of wool. But um, having come from the background that they do, they have a very strong heritage in processing wool, um, carbonising, scouring, open tops, uh, worsted tops, so all that side of the, the business is still a big part of what Fox and Lily do. Um, a lot of the other exporters may be more focused on just purely trading, but Fox and Lily see it's important to also have a processing part of their business as well as trading. And then there's the side that uh, I work for, which is dealing with the wool growers on the, the brokerage side. So it's quite a diverse business. Um, and, you know, year on year it um, seems to, to grow a bit more, but that's uh, the nature of these things, I suppose. You you don't end up growing quickly, but if you it's sustainable, like we're talking about sustainability today, and I think you know business growth is a bit the same. It's sustainable um, if you you grow it from a solid base and don't go uh, and try and be too silly. Yeah. I th and I think there's not a much uh, there's not a lot of companies that can uh, say they're almost 70 years old now. So uh, so solid base is extremely important to, to, to get that old in the industry close to 70 years. Well done. Sure. Yeah, it's fantastic. And the next generation of the family has joined the the business. So um, yeah, tremendous. Yeah, we look forward to um, you know hopefully another 70 you know happy years in the wool business. So, Eamon, maybe you can give us a little bit of an overview of the services that Fox and Lily offer to their growers and some market opportunities that are created for them. Um, well, certainly I think the advantage that Fox and Lily as a broker have is having the um, other side of our business, which is an exporter. So that gives us a lot of um, good information uh, and the ability to put wool straight into export orders, and it has, you know, that's been the case for 
um, many years, but um, of more recent times is uh, has been the opportunity that the the company took advantage of to move into these strongly into the sustainable area by being involved in the uh, RWS responsible wool standard. Um, and certainly, we appreciate that not all the, um, the the growers in our business or in Australia um, want to go down that pathway, and that's fine. Um, but then, for those people who decided they want to go down that pathway, we thought, well, there is an an avenue there because the textile exchanges put this framework in place, and there are growers at this end who are heading down in that direction. So it's really been a case of putting the two parts of the equation together and having an export processing um, company into the mix, it really helps. I think uh, other businesses are just trying to do it either as an exporter or as a, a broker. So I think the, the advantage for our business is obviously the um, the understanding of where growers' wool is going and the opportunity to uh, give them feedback and also um, to include them when um, visitors are, will be coming to Australia, which we presume will happen again one day next year or the year after whenever travel becomes um, a bit more normal. So, yes, I think um, our, our business is lucky in that regard. It's got both sides and the business has taken a long-term view in terms of looking at this ethical, sustainable platform that's available and trying to grow the um, the interest overseas in it and also from a local perspective of growers already going down that path to give them the access and the opportunity to avail themselves of the opportunities. Absolutely. And while we answer that question, maybe a bit of an overview on how the focus on sustainability has impacted the wool value chain from your perspective from Fox and Lily. Certainly, it's um, having put the structure in place um, with the growers, um, it then allows that the chain of custody, uh, which then occurs, um, to have that um, ability to give feedback to people. And, um, and also, I think that recognition that people can then get for um, the work that they're doing if they're you know, going down that particular track and certainly there's a, an avenue there where customers overseas are asking for more in terms of the background and the provenance. So we're, we're finding we're doing a lot more um, videos, photos, farm stories to provide to the customers who want um, a bit more meat on the bone, if you like. So I think um, those sort of things will probably see um, more and more focus, um, as I imagine, you know, you're probably seeing the same things from your perspective with, um, you know, the customers that are buying the wool out of South Africa on the, uh, you know, sustainable ethical. They're probably looking at a similar scenario to what the, you know, what we're being asked to do. I would imagine that's the case from your end. Absolutely, yes. I think it's about authenticity and transparency. Um, and storytelling, really. We have such fantastic stories um, from both countries and the world wants to know about those. Yes, yeah, no, there are a lot of great things we can speak about. And, um, and I think it's, you know, with you know, technology now gives us so many more opportunities to be able to get that story f um, further and wider than, you know, we've ever had before. And I suppose last year gives us a great example of that where so many more people um, you know, we're shopping at home online, etc. So, you know, the idea of it all being down to the bricks and mortar, now that um, there's so much more online and then online people can then do their research and follow up and um, track down the, the stories and um, get a real feel for the authenticity. It's, um, it's quite an exciting time. Absolutely. You know, uh, interesting, we started the season, or yourself started the season with a, with a lot of stock in, on hand, greasy stock. Uh, have you got rid of a lot of it? And how do you see the rest of the season going through with it? Uh, it is slowly being sold down, um, but fortunately um, there hasn't been a rush to market with it. So as the market has improved, in the last couple of months, you have seen more people prepared to put up some of that old stock 
into the system. And I think we'll see the next couple of months as we head towards the end of our, our financial year, which is end of June, um, will probably be a bit of a catalyst for more people putting that wool up. And that sort of coincides with traditionally this time of year, which becomes a little bit slower for wool flow from our perspective. So hopefully um, we'll see if it's, if it's a staged sell down over the next couple of months. I don't think that'll have um, a great, you know, detrimental impact on the market. The market, I think, can absorb it without uh, too much trouble and there doesn't seem to be a, a rush to sell as such. So um, the picture at this point looks pretty good. The the whole, probably the, the greatest um, dilemma that our industry is facing, and I imagine it must be much the same in South Africa, but it's just the uh, the difficulty with logistics of wool at the moment and shipping. So the wool packing houses uh, are under enormous pressure because the shipments have been delayed um, so much over the previous few months, all related to this whole COVID situation and less vessels on the water and the price of shipping being more expensive, etc. So um, the wool packing houses just can't handle the volume um, at the moment. So there's a little bit of a log jam um, with actually getting wool into containers and onto vessels. Um, vessels are changing their shipping schedules with only days, you know, notice to the shippers uh, and then obviously letters of credit have to be amended so then payments are not coming into the exporters. So it's putting an enormous amount of pressure on the whole infrastructure of the industry and uh, I would have thought that the market might have actually been a little bit more vulnerable lately because of the amount of exporters who are having to sit on wall for much longer than they usually do. They're paying interest, they're paying storage uh, and they can't get their money back because the, you know, the shipping is much delayed compared to a usual uh, season. Uh, but I think it's a, a good sign of the robustness of the demand equation, the fact that the market is still maintaining its levels um, the, uh, reasonably well the way it has been. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you had a bumper over, over March uh, that was record volumes that you sold uh, for the last 10 years. Yes, yes, you're right. And certainly in March was um, a 25% increase in the amount of wool we had tested in Australia compared to the March the previous year. And March of last year, of course, uh, COVID hadn't really, hadn't hit us. Well, it was only just starting to happen in mid-March, so it didn't impact on growers actually you know, making the decision to send wool in, which, you know, was happening in January, February to generate those March testing figures. So the COVID impact was only later in the year. So the fact that we've seen a 25% increase in tested wool was um, very much down to the impact of the much better growing conditions in eastern Australia, the, you know, the horrible drought that we had um, over a number of seasons, which sort of broke about 18 months ago. And we've seen a, a huge increase in the um, cut per head of a lot of the sheep in eastern Australia. Um, a smaller factor has been wool was held back um, after, you know, after April when the COVID you know, really got going. Um, some of that wool sat in wool sheds and has come in, you know, in February, and that has boosted up the testing a little bit. But most of that testing, I believe, comes down purely to seasonal conditions and how much better it's been and how much green grass we've seen in so many parts of Australia, which had been parched for... Um, basically the previous three years for, for a lot of people and for some people a bit more. Yeah, how do you find the quality of those clips coming in at the moment out of those good conditions? Um, very pleased to say that the uh, the yield of the wool is significantly up. So when we looked at the wool that was coming through the system over the last, you know, 18 months and two years, there were so many uh, dusty, backy clips coming through and, it was a real challenge for people buying wool. Um, they were avoiding things, you know, with all these low yields and trying to average them, them into parcels. And so the discounts that were opening up on those low yielding things was quite significant. Um, and it was, um, you know, a real challenge. But and now um, it seems to be, uh, you know, behind us. And the only low yielding wools you'll really see at the moment are the those old wools, you know, which might be, uh, been sitting around in the store for a year or two and um, they're dragging the samples out and selling them. But um, otherwise, most of what we're seeing is back to um, 
nor wielding wool and um, a much easier equation for everyone to handle. Iman, you were talking about challenges. through a year, year and a half, where challenges are, are nothing new to, to us at this stage. Uh, we, we came out of the whole, the whole COVID uh, process, which, which influenced the prices uh, negatively by quite a big margin. Um, where do you see, uh, we actually had in 2018, we had uh, excellent, one of the best years ever, and, and the same with you guys. Uh, but we're slowly returning to acceptable levels. Do you think we will see our 2018 levels soon again, or, or should we budget maybe a little bit lower than our 2018 levels? 2018 historically was um, very high in terms of the price levels. Um, and I do you know, recall when we were still able to travel, we actually had a group of wool growers um, from Australia, which we took over to Europe, to um, show them how the wool is transformed from the greasy state into the wonderful products that it does become. Anyway, it sticks in my mind that um, we um, spoke to a number of people when we were away who all kept saying the same thing. You know, the price of yarn is uh, is too expensive and we're having to steer away from using it at the moment. So and that was a, a phrase that we heard, you know, regularly enough while we were away. So um, I think, you know, the, the price of things is not, um, you know, there, there has to be an upper limit. And 2018, I think, showed us, um, you know, that the upper limit was there. Not to say that we won't get back there, but I think, I don't think we're going to see 2018 prices for maybe, you know, a couple of years. It'll take a while for the you know, textile chain to build up and um, get that momentum. And so, um, but certainly, I mean, having said that, you know, there's markets within markets. And from our perspective, um, when you look at the, you know, price that the finer microns are bringing, so once you get under 18 micron and certainly under 17, um, the prices that those wools have been bringing, um, particularly the last couple of months, the recovery in those levels has been huge, uh, which, you know, coincides with um, a great amount of interest out of China for the finer microns, you know, very much based on the, the knitwear sector there and um, how strongly that's been performing. So um, when we reference the high prices of 2018, if we look at 20 and 21 micron, we're obviously a long, long way under what the levels were back then. Um, so it might be, as I say, some time until we see things you know, go to those levels again. The finer microns, I think, you could say there seems to be a greater appreciation, if you like, from China for the finer micron. So we'll probably, I would suggest, see um, a still a good premium between the mediums and the fine and the super fine um, over time because, yeah, as I say, I think the, the designers and the fashion people in China, which obviously is a significant, you know, uh, part of the equation for us now. You know, China's not what it was to us. China 20 years ago and 25 years ago was a staging post. It was just send the wall there and that would be partially converted or converted into, you know, whether it was tops or yarn or fabric or whatever, and it was leaving China and going elsewhere. Most of the clothes that were being made in China 20 years ago out of wool, 25 years ago, were, was the uniform market. It was such a, a big volume user, um, obviously for the train drivers and the police and military, etc. But these days, if someone in China is wearing something made from wool, it's not something that's been um, supplied for their job. They've actually made that discretionary choice to go out and purchase um, a lovely piece of clothing. So whether it was like we saw a couple of years ago with the fake fur or the, um, the, the felted fabrics for the you know, long coats for winter, um, and certainly what we're seeing these days is just this enormous um, growth in the, the knitwear side of the market, which has been you know, augmented by the development of such wonderful technology in the knitwear sector. We're seeing you know, machinery now it's able to, to, to make garments um, in one single pass. So, and, and that's never happened before. It's always had to be 
um, a lot of labour involved in stitching, you know, the panels and the sleeves together, etc. But now you can actually get machines that you load them up with your yarn and then within one hour a completed garment comes off the machine. All you have to do is um, wash it, um, fold it, put it in a package and it's finished. So, uh, and you see the, the amount of um, different ways that uh, fabrics can now be um, created with knitwear machinery. Well, they're even starting to, as strange as it seems, mimic the look of woven cloth out of knitwear. So the finishes and the types that they're able to make out of um, knitwear machinery and the advances that have happened in the last 10 or 15 years um, is just mind-boggling. And, you know, in a nutshell, it's been a game-changer for um, for the industry. And without it, because of the shrinking nature of um, cloth and the, the woven part of the market, less people wearing formal clothing, um, our industry would have faced a real challenge in terms of um, moving the volume of wool that we have. So um, make no mistake about it. To me, um, I'm completely um, a huge believer in how massive a uh, um, improvement to our industry has been made because of the increase in the technology for knitwear. You mean you've talked on the on the on the finer side, on the on the price difference between the finer wool and the uh, and the 18 and a half, 19 micron plus wool. Um, with better growing conditions, you, you obviously going to be having a little bit broader microns, so the supply will be will be higher in the broader micron group. Um, in the medium term, how is that going to affect? Uh, so I don't see any big price changes between the fine and the broader microns within the medium term because of uh, of supply within the broader micron group. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that that will you know keep the pressure on the finer micron because you won't be able to get supply of it as easily. Um, and in terms of will the extra supply in the mediums um, put a bit of pressure on the price? Yeah, could do. Um, but from a lot of growers' perspectives, because they're now able to get you know much greater cut per head with the better seasonal conditions, one sort of offsetting the other. So the growers are you know pushing more bales out the door from their wool sheds than they were two and three years ago in a, in many districts. So um, that's not going to present, I think. Um, you know, the, the challenge that um, it might otherwise be. But now for the difficulty, uh, how do you see the wool industry in 10 years' time? Uh, are we on good levels? Where, where are we going? Um, that's a very good question. I think um, what we're experiencing here, and um, I, I'm sort of reading that it's happening in a lot of other parts of the world in terms of agricultural and farmland is um, significant run up in the value of, of land. And, um, and no industry is immune from competitive pressure. So wool will have to um, have that incentive there for people to keep growing it uh, to justify the price that the land, the land is. So I think, um, you know, from that perspective, if there is a if there are some people that choose to exit the industry, I think um, we will certainly see the ones that stay that will be rewarded because when you look at the um, factors that people want wool for in terms of its you know great environmental credentials and obviously a wonderful fibre to wear and a, you know obviously uh, make great fashionable garments, those things you know are not going to change. So unless we see synthetics that can, you know, mimic um, what wool does in every way, but, of course, the consumer is getting, you know, more and more um, focused about the um, about natural fibres and, and also, you know, it's, very, it's become quite a big issue, things like the microplastics. So obviously there are there is issues around... Uh, the production and then the washing and the of the garments that are not made from natural fibres. So I think um, those factors, you know, obviously stack up really well for wool. Um, but as I say, it's just, you know, there, there will be competition for, for land use. Um, so wool will have to um, make sure that, you know, to compete with all the other 
industries. And as obviously we spoke about the technology with knitwear, obviously the technology for a lot of other farming practices is improving the yields for you know whatever other practices people are, are doing. Um, and as as is happening with with the wool industry, it's a lot more productive than it was 20 and 30 years ago um, in terms of on-farm production. So we're certainly going to have to keep up our R&D um, in terms of on-farm to uh, allow farmers to um, make the most of whatever gains they can um, because obviously um, the cost price squeeze is one thing that um, is a, a constant in our lives, isn't it? Absolutely. Neiman? Thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate it. Um, we, we, we had some great insights from you, from you so, so appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much and um, wish you all the best and um, we look forward to you know, a great future for those of us who are involved in this boutique wonderful fibre. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Our next wool auction will be on the 21st of April 2021 and we will be ready with a market report just after the auction. Thank you to everyone listening and have a good evening. Jock, to you as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.